In our last episode, we explored how the WHO and Google are collaborating in order to control the information and content available regarding health on the Internet. Not only do they want total control of health information, now they also want to reclassify and redefine what is harmful without any scientific basis. We also touched upon the failure of the WHO in dealing with public health crises such as Ebola. WHO people were really not at the level required for the job. Their coordinator never worked on Ebola before. Immediately I thought, those people are useless. They don't even understand what they're supposed to do here. And their shambolic response to COVID-19 that cost countless lives. It is somehow unimaginable, unbelievable, that in the most famous city of the richest country in the world, they're digging mass graves for those who can't afford a funeral and for those who died of coronavirus with no next of kin. The WHO pandemic response was totally inept not to mention their dubious support of countries like Russia, who are held up as public health heroes and praised by Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus for their work for maternal and child health. Meanwhile, directing troops to bomb maternity hospitals and kidnap children in Ukraine. Russia is guilty of a war crime after a maternity and children's hospital was bombed in the besieged southern city of Mariupol. Even more unbelievable, the election of dictator and global pariah Kim Jong-un to the WHO executive board. So, how can an organization rife with ineptitude such as the WHO be trusted to make reliable and evidence-based policy recommendations? The WHO released its ninth report on the tobacco epidemic. Funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies, it claims that aerosols commonly emitted by heated tobacco products fall under the definition of smoke. The citation for this is not a scientific document, but instead an opinion piece that stated, aerosols generated by chemical reactions involving heat should be termed smoke. Therefore, according to the WHO, when you are cooking your dinner, taking a shower, or making your morning coffee, you are being exposed to smoke even though combustion is not involved. Steam is not smoke. The question then is why are they doing this? Why are they trying to change the definition of smoke? The answer is so they can promote the prohibition of safer nicotine products and ask signatory countries to treat the safer options the same as the harmful option. Martin Cullop from the Taxpayer Protections Alliance stated that there is no substantive justification and that the WHO is promoting that there is a need to regulate novel and emerging tobacco products by applying traditional tobacco control measures. Clive Bates, former lead of ASH UK, states, there appears to be no room for the objective evaluation of science in advance of the COP10. In review, you could be forgiven for concluding that the WHO wished to protect the incumbent cigarette trade. Instead of relying upon science and facts, as was the intent of the FCTC at its inception, the WHO is now making up their own definitions and facts to fight harm reduction. Harm reduction is not the enemy. We asked Dr. Rohan Sequiera, MD, an internal medicine physician who specializes in endocrinology, why he thinks the WHO is redefining smoke, what they hope to accomplish with this process, and what the impact of the disinformation will be not only with his medical peers, but the millions of people who still smoke globally who would benefit from safer nicotine products. The WHO has got certain things uh, wrong on the very fact that they want to classify vapor as smoke. Um, Despite differences between the two concepts, uh, there's a very fundamental difference between smoke and vapor in basically how the two substances are produced. For smoke to be produced, a substance must undergo combustion. And usually when you look at cigarette smoke, it's incomplete combustion. 
On the other hand, vapor is basically produced when a substance undergoes vaporization. That means it changes from one form to the other without going through any changes in combustion. So in, in, in other sense, the WHO is trying to say that vapor is smoke, which I think is a very uh, fundamental uh, paradigm shift in the way in how chemicals are produced. And uh, this is going to have a huge implication with regards to um, uh, the choice of any individual patient who's trying to give up his uh, uh, addiction from a harmful, uh, uh, you know, harmful point of view and going to a lesser harmful point of view. So I think they really need to understand that uh, uh, smoke and vapor are two def different chemical entities. And this is something which they need to understand. What the cabinet has given approval today is first a decision to ban e-cigarettes. All the propaganda that's been happening in this country over the last three to four years since they've decided to uh, demonize vaping, a lot of medical fraternity have not been given the real picture. And even if you have a look at a lot of the statements issued by many other consultants, they still feel that vaping is the same as smoking. Whereas, like I said in my previous statement, that vape is not smoke they have two different entities uh, of course when you when you when you burn cigarettes uh, the temperature at the tip of the cigarette is 900 degrees centigrade when you look at vape it's anywhere between 100 to 300 um, in smoke we get a lot of uh, harmful chemicals they have identified 7,000 chemicals in cigarette smoke uh, if you look at vapor it's just transformation of one compound into a different state so if you go by the WHO statement even steam would be smoke right because it's changing from one form to the other now that means every patient of mine who's got a cough and cold and he's going to be vaporizing steam that patient's also a smoker so you understand the inherent uh, flaw in the statement of the who trying to classify smoke into vapor right now with regards to my own experiences with my patients I have had some really, really interesting uh, data which has come across where patients who have been chronic smokers for 20, 30 years coming to me with cardiac disease, coming to me with diabetes, with cholesterol <laughs> issues and all of these things. Many of these patients also had lung issues. They had difficulty in breathing. And through my own past experiences with hundreds of my patients who have transformed from cigarette smoking into vape. Uh, or vapor based products. Uh, we found significant results in these patients wanting to quit nicotine. Uh, many of my patients have been off nicotine over a period of time. They've, they've tapered off their dose of nicotine, which is not possible with smoking. I can't reduce the amount of smoke, uh, the amount of nicotine, right? So definitely it allows for a, a huge opportunity for patients who want to give up smoking but they want to continue having the organoleptic properties that smoke or vapor or the feel, you know, that all adds to the psychosomatic uh, concept of smoking. I think doctors really need to look at this in a very positive light. That's a really sad thing, but uh, I think a lot of uh, medical fraternity education is required in this area, which has not been attempted so far. According to Clive Bates, since it was finalized 20 years ago, the FCTC has drifted far from its original purpose to contain and reduce the health and welfare harms primarily arising from smoking. The 2023 COP10 documents show that much of its energy is now devoted to fighting harm reduction. The problem with opposing harm reduction is that it is likely to cause harm increase. An organization that is pushing pandemic treaties, the nonsensical redefinition of scientific facts, and then wants overarching control of health information. Is this really what public health needs?